Why don't you trade and let Miss Kate take his turn? I did, and I asked her how she wanted me to do it. She never responded. Does Indiana go first? We'll go either. I don't think she'll go second. I think she'll go third or fourth. That girl, isn't the girl from NC State? Is she, is she didn't come out? And what about the girl? No, Gigi's a freshman. Check one. Check one. Check one.
the card behind you. Jack, close session. Who do we go? Same, Same place. place. Yeah. Never check. I guess this is uh, and we just kind of know what we're doing. I just looking for the flag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it was I'm just making sure of the flag. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we got Ms. Wilson on show because Ms. Ms. Turner didn't want to have that on her show. She gave me the look when you were turning. Testing. Oh, yeah, we're working. Okay. Um, we'll call our. Can y'all hear me okay? We okay? All right, thank you. We'll call our Monday, April the 15th, uh, 2024 Board of Education meeting to order. Uh, thank y'all for being here. We'll have a whole lot more joining, I'm sure, in just a few minutes. But do I have a motion to go into closed session for the items listed on the agenda? So moved. Second. Got a motion and a second. All in favor with an aye. 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 Thank you.
Oh, thank you. I appreciate that, John. Thanks for the heads up, too. We'll consider ourselves back in open session. Thank you all for being being here. We've got others sequestered over there too, so we've got people all over the building. So we'll we'll have them rolling through here before long. But thank y'all for taking the time to be here with us. Uh, we appreciate it tremendously. Um, and I will turn it over to Ms. Wilson. So now we would like to take a moment of silence to contemplate our collective work together on behalf of our students here in Chatham County. Thank you. Let's all stand for our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Got a motion and a second. All in favor with an aye. 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 
Any opposed, Langstein? Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel agenda? So moved. Second. Second. Got a motion and a couple of seconds. All mm -hmm. in favor with an aye? Aye. aye. Any opposed, Langstein? And one more. <laughs> Do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Got a motion and a second. All in favor with an aye? Aye. aye. Any opposed, like sign? Thank you. Are y'all hearing me okay? Everybody's good. Okay. Thank y'all. Um, all right. Dr. Jackson, we'll turn it over to superintendent's announcements and comments, please. Good evening, Mr. Chair, and thank you. Um, we will, um, in your package, you have the um, our celebrations uh, document. I just want to hit a few of the items that are on there, if you'll bring that up. Um, uh, and this will be a part of the report that we release, but just a couple of things. Um, one, on the third slide, I'm sorry, second slide, we want to celebrate Ms. Colleen D'Angelo, who's our WRAL uh, Teacher of the Year. Go to the second slide, please. Second, thank you. Our um, Teacher of the Year, um, if you will, go to the um, fourth slide. Um, that one, next one, I'm sorry. Um, we were so excited to have our Seaforth uh, Theater Department perform at the Department of Public Instruction. If you missed their Little Shops presentation, it was absolutely amazing. But they were they performed in the lobby of the uh, State Department of Public Instruction. I was excited to to be there. Next slide, please. Uh, we had BetaBox, which is a uh, uh, gaming and technology uh, company with a lot of um, uh, artificial intelligence and interactive robotics. Uh, uh, bring their mobile uh, lab down to our One Academy, and our students were allowed to spend time with that. It was a great day. Uh, you saw kids on the ground on the uh, writing code for uh, robots and uh, things. You see the little cars and all that kind of stuff. They were racing and doing all kinds of things. It was a great day uh, for our students. Um, go up um, two slides, please. One more. There. We want to congratulate four of our, our individuals who earned doctorates this year. Not only are, do we have great employees, but we also have continuous learners who work with our district. Uh, and to see four of them all earn their doctoral degrees within a seven-day period, uh, we joke that we had more doctors than in urgent care. Um, <laughs> and, so it was fun to, to celebrate with them. But uh, doctors uh, uh, April Burko, who's principal at uh, uh, Jordan Matthews, uh, Dr. Um, Michelle Burton, who is our secondary director, uh, Dr. Caroline Linker, who's our principal at Silk Hope, and Dr. Jamie McFadder, who is in our Excellence and Opportunity Office. We congratulate them all. It's a lot of work going in. Next slide is our Uni United Sports Day at Seaforth, uh, where they, and that is not Principal um, St. Clair flying in. That's, uh, who is that? Um, what's the name of them? The Knights? Golden Knights, Golden Knights uh, flying in. Uh, I'm told that's the way Dr. Sinclair arrives to work every day, but um, we were happy to have them there uh, to celebrate our, our students. Uh, and I'm always grateful to see Mikey, who runs the school system, if he hasn't told you already, uh, down there in the blue shirt. Um, Mikey's going to find his way and do what he needs to do. Um, we had three visits from Leadership Chatham uh, to our Virginia Cross, uh, uh, George Moses Horton, and to our Northwood uh, high school programs to visit all. They were all just absolutely um, uh, enamored with the work that our students were doing uh, and surprised to see the depth of experiences that we provide to our students across the district. Um, and then uh, the next slide. Uh, for the sixth year in a row, we have been designated the best community for music education. This is, we are only two districts in the state of North Carolina who have met this designation, and we have done it one of few uh, who have done it uh, six years in a row. Uh, and so our fine arts teachers, I think you'll hear more about it. Um, you'll hear more about it tonight, but our fine arts teachers have done an amazing job uh, doing that. And then um, we had our community leaders who toured our One Academy on Friday to talk about the supports that we provide for all of our students. And we're going to be offering that tour over and over again. So if you, if you would like to spend time at our One Academy learning about all of the things that we do to try to meet the needs of our students um, uh, uh, across the district, uh, we'll be looking out for that. We'll do a sign up. We can only do a certain amount. It's a small school, so we can only take a few at a time to do it. But we'd love to have you do that. 
And then this week, if you have nothing to do, I think I was told earlier today they are sold out. Oops. Well, we'll tell you about Frozen uh, <laughs> next week. It's going to be great. We know it will be. Uh, and this is a community um, just special. We're one of, uh, we're the only high school in North Carolina given permission uh, to produce this show. And so we've been, it's been a year in, in the works. And so uh, with Frozen, um, it's going to be an amazing um, uh, presentation. It not only has students from Jordan Matthews, but there are students from all of our schools participating in this musical. Uh, even some of our younger um, students in elementary and middle school. This is going to be a community event that really does bring together the best of, of what we have in Chatham. So we're excited about it. Those who have tickets, you'll tell us about it. Those who don't, you'll hear about it. So thank you so much. Um, and then our, the final thing I'm going to touch is our, um, we had another student get a perfect score on the ACT again this year. Um, Jacob Phillips, a student at Seaforth High School, a junior, um, it, uh, uh, accomplished that once again. Uh, and we're so excited for him. And, and I think it's also worth noting that Jacob is the uh, son of one of our employees, um, which means that when it's, a, it's, an, it's an amazing thing when we have good employees, but when our employees trust us with their uh, most prized asset, that's something to, to absolutely celebrate. So we're excited about that, and we want to congratulate he and his mom on and their and his family for the work that's gone in. And thank you for partnering with us. Um, and uh, the last thing is we had a, a, a dear day, drop everything and read day on last Friday, uh, where everyone in the district was encouraged to stop everything they're doing for 30 minutes and just read. Um, if reading is important, we have to act like it and behave that way. And so if literacy is important for kids, it's important for adults. So you'll see all around the district where we had a lot of dear activities going on across the district. And with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close that, that part of it out. Just some great things going on in the, in the district. Um, our next item, uh, Mr. Chair, would be the... Yeah, uh, Best Communities for Music, Dr. Moran. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. My name is Amanda Moran. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Academic Services and Instructional Support. And this item aligns with priority one and five of our strategic plan. Um, Dr. Jackson stole a little bit of the thunder here, but we are excited that we were honored with the best communities for music education once again. This is our sixth year in a row, and this year only two other districts in, or there were only two districts in the state of North Carolina, we were one of those, who received this recognition. It is a national recognition, and it's awarded to districts that demonstrate outstanding achievement for providing music access and education to all students. Um, this is not an easy process. Um, the application is large, and in order to qualify, we had to answer some pretty detailed questions about what funding we provide for music education, our graduation, graduation rates and requirements, music class participation, instructional time, facility support for the music program, and more. Um, I'd like to thank Sharon Allen, our lead arts teacher, who was unable to be here tonight because she takes on this large um, task of filling out that application each and every year. And it does require a lot of work from our entire academic services team. Um, we do know that research tells us that students who participate in music programs have many benefits, both academic benefits and also social skill benefits. Um, one of those is higher gra graduation rates as well as college um, acceptance rates. Also, higher processing and reading skills. So we are excited that we have so many amazing opportunities for our students. Um, this award would also not be possible without all of our community organizations in the arts that help support our programs. Also, our parents um, for their support of our student musicians and performers. Um, and of course, our students. Um, we have amazing students here in our district. And like Dr. Jackson mentioned, if you've not been to one of our performances, um, we'll be sharing some of the upcoming events for the end of the year with you. And so please um, take a moment and go to some of those performances. Um, as a former both band and choral student and a mom of a former marching charger, I have seen firsthand how our music programs really impact our students. My daughter was one of those students who did not like school, which was heartbreaking for me as an educator. But band was what kept her engaged in school, and it's where she found her place. 
um, in the school day. And so that happens for many of our students. That's where they have that creative outlet, and that's where they find their connectedness to school. So we're really excited um, about this award, um, and we hope to be able to take it home for a seventh year. Thank you. Our next item is uh, high school athletic recognitions. Um, device. Or middle school, which is? I'm sorry, middle school. Middle school Thank first, you. then high school. Thank you. All right, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Jackson, we're going to start with our middle school basketball champions. And the first team is the Pollard girls. And we have their coach, Mr. Baldwin, and their principal, Mrs. Doty, here today. And they will be introducing their, their championship students who will be coming in. And we'll just take them right across here. And we'll go right out this door here and back up to the front lobby. And we will go from there. And I'll let you guys announce your kids. All right. All right. First, we have Carson Morris. Next, we have Waylon Hardy. Next, Amber Brown. Then Evie Bitter, Grace DeRace Rosso, Olivia Parker, Deanna Messi, Emma Pacer, Noel Whitaker, Naomi Stevenson, Lucia. Kelly, Tatum Dale, Lila Jacobs, Blair Hill, Neil Lyles, and Reese Caldwell. And we got a cheerleader that came with us, Margot Davis. And I want to introduce our athletic director, uh, Ben Waters. Uh, I, and also, uh, and also our assistant coach that couldn't be here, Fred Whitaker. With the cheerleaders, this is a true story. I was at the. Uh, Pollard Bonway came to Bonway, and, and uh, grandparents come up with and sat down beside me from Bonway. And the cheerleaders were out on the court doing their thing. And she leaned over and she said, Where are these kids from? And I said, Well, they're from the visitors, they're from Pollard. And she said, High schools aren't this big. <laughs> <laughs> And our boys tournament champions are from Chatham Middle School. And Mr. Leak, the principal, is here today, as well as Dr. Warner, the assistant principal, and Todd Bean, uh, the athletic director. And I'm going to let Mr. Leak announce his students. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I am pleased to present um, the cheerleading squad from Chatham Middle, led by head coach Courtney Wilma, Samaya Garner, Sophia Grimes, Abigail Herrera, Cheyenne Hopkins, Brianna Balderas, Martina Lozano, Gesamani Ramos, Yaslin Rincon, Vanessa Cifuentes, Stephanie Velasquez, Carly Wiggins, and Madison Wilmoth. Our boys basketball team over the last two years has a record of 33 and 1. Whoa. With a record of 16 and 1 for this basketball season. Led by head coach Ryan Seiler and assistant coach Jared Seiler, who are unable to make it tonight. Daniel Carter, Samuel Saran, Christopher Crutchfield, Jaden Glover, Corin Hedden. 
Elijah June, Caleb Langley, Darius Miller, Nolan Mitchell, Lennox Mordecai, Hector Paredes, Emilio Rocho, David Suarez, Iker Vicente, Matthew Victorino, and Tristan Brooks. And Coach Todd Bean is our athletic director. Thank you. All right, and now we wanted to recognize the fall and spring sports for our high schools. I'm sorry to say that we don't have as many student athletes here because a number of them are playing and are at games and practices yeah. tonight. Uh, but we have representatives from each school. Uh, actually, I'm going to have Mr. Peel, if he would, to come up and announce uh, Chatham Central stuff, and then if you'll just go down the line and shake hands. And Tommy, Mr. Peel is the athletic director at Chatham Central. All right, good evening. Um, again, I'm Thomas Peel, athletic director at Chatham Central High School. And the first team I want to recognize goes back to our fall season, our women's tennis team. Uh, women's tennis at Chatham Central, they won the 1A Conference Tournament Championship. Uh, by defeating Northmore, and the women's tennis team consisted of Emma Townsend, Jazz Martin, Carly Callahan, and Carly was also the also the 1A conference singles champion for women's tennis. Uh, Hallie Webster, Ashlyn Humphrey, Emma Manus, Lauren Cavanis, and Rachel Albright. And Lauren Cavanis and Rachel Albright were the 1A Conference doubles champions for women's tennis. And Leslie Carrillo Rangel also was a member of the women's tennis team. Uh, they were coached by head coach Heather Brooks and assistant coach Wendy Phillips. In our winter sports season, uh, we want to recognize from our swimming team, uh, Mr. Jesse Eskelin. Jesse is a sophomore at Chatham Central. He was the Mid-Carolina 1A-2A Conference Swimmer of the Year. He's the conference champion in the 50-yard freestyle and the 100-yard freestyle. He was also at the 1A-2A Regionals. He was the regional champion in the 100-yard freestyle and runner-up in the 50-yard freestyle. At the state championships for the 1A, 2A division, uh, he was the in finishing the top five in the state for the 100-yard freestyle, and he was a state medalist in the 50-yard freestyle at the 1A, 2A state championships. That's from swimming, Jesse Eskelin. All right, next is Jordan Matthews High School. We have the principal, Dr. Burko, as well as the athletic director, Mr. Barry West. And that was a doctor with a, that's a new title, right? It is. That's, yes. what that's why she's here with me. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, I'm Barry West, athletic director, Jordan Matthews, joined by my principal, Dr. April Burko. We're very proud of that title now that we have her on board. We have with us uh, our representatives of our men's soccer program, Jonathan Campos, Coach Paul Quadros. They just won their fourth consecutive conference championship. And Coach Quadros, that was championship number 12 for Coach Quadros as our head coach. So Jonathan being a senior, this is his fourth time winning the conference. And also he was recently named a representative in the East-West All-Star Game in Ju on July 9th, 16th. He, Jonathan will be act as, as strong as our soccer program has been. Jonathan is the first soccer representative that JM has had in the East-West All-Stars. So. You saved me a question. I was going to ask. I thought, that was first, but I couldn't. Yes, sir. And our, our, first, our first representative in East-West is 2016. And I also have with us Coach Jimmy Long, our men's wrestling team, and Jakari Blue. And Jakari's accomplishments are very extensive. Coach Long, I'm going to let you uh, 
right off the Jakari's accomplishment, please. All right. Hey, good evening. My name is Jimmy Long. I'm the head wrestling coach for Jordan Matthews High School. Uh, so Jakari is a sophomore. Um, he finished the season. He he wrapped up a uh, his second um, uh, all conference title. He, he, I'm sorry, not title, but he played second two years in a row. He was also a state qualifier that makes him the third wrestler in the history at JM to make it to states. Um, he also set two school records uh, for most single season wins of 33 and most single season pins of 20. He's got two more. Do what? He's just a sophomore, right? Yeah, that's great. He's just a sophomore. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, sophomore. All right, Northwood High School is represented by Mr. Adam Lutterlow, one of the assistant principals. Mr. Lutterlow. Good evening. Um, so happy to celebrate uh, several of our chargers who had outstanding uh, winter sports seasons this year. Got to find it back on the cell phone. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, first, uh, Delaney Babo was a state champion in the indoor uh, winter track season for pole vault. Very proud of her accomplishment. Uh, Abby Emmerich was a state champion in swimming. She placed first in the 200 meter free and 100 yard backstroke. Uh, she is a multi-time state champion. She won last year as well. Our girls basketball team won the conference tournament this year. Those team members were Skylar Adams, Michelle Cardozo, Nia Henry, Shayla Glover, Michaela Glover, Natalia Whitaker, Josiah Cotton, Naki Ellis, Aaliyah Roberts, Kira Parrish, Amari Bullitt, and Madeline Brooks. And they were coached by uh, Miss Carrie Snipes, uh, Tommy Snipes, Jerry Lux, and Jasmine Atkins. Uh, our boys basketball team had an outstanding season. Uh, they were the conference champion and the conference tournament champion this year. Uh, and they advanced to the uh, final eight in the state tournament. The team members were Drake Powell, Fred Whitaker, Bo Harvey, Cam Fowler, Chad Graves, Jake Layton, Hayes Burleson, Antoine Brewington, Jaden Holder, Reese Adams, Jalen Skurlock, Ashton Elliott, Griffin Hobbs, and Isaiah Blair, coached by Matt Brown, Ethan Polis, Fred Whitaker Sr., Tyler Zeller, and Marcus Shaw. Uh, and Drake Powell this year won in numerous uh, accolades. Uh, he was Conference Player of the Year, uh, and he was named a McDonald's All-American, which I believe was the first McDonald's All-American awarded in Chatham County. Thank you. And finally, Seaforth High School, who, and I'll steal just a touch of Dr. St. Clair's thunder. And by the way, this is Dr. St. Clair, the principal, uh, who's here this evening. Uh, Seaforth High School is in the running, knock on wood, to win the Wachovia <coughs> Cup. And the Wachovia Cup is a presentation at the end of the year that is given to the athletic program that has had the best season overall for the entire state in their division. And Seaforth right now is well in the lead. And uh, that would be an incredible achievement. So, Dr. St. Clair. Good evening, board. Um, Mr. Chair, Dr. Jackson. Um, I'm super excited uh, about our sports teams. Um, and please forgive me because uh, my AD could not be here today because he's tied up at the soccer game. So I'm trying to read through emails he's sending me. So <laughs> I'm going to try and do this in proper fashion. But we truly are excited about our student athletes. I want to first recognize um, 
just generally speaking, our, our, our programs, our women's basketball team made it to the Final Four in the state competition this year. So I want to recognize Coach Bird. Um, men's cross country, they had a phenomenal year by coached by Coach Mitchell, Jack Anstrom, and Will Quickie, both are state champions. Um, Volleyball did well as well. Coach Green and Kira Rosamarco did, had, had a great season. And our swim uh, teams, uh, Coach Peel, Coach Vaughn, Coach LaJoy, La La and Ben LaJoy, they all did a phenomenal job of coaching our team. Ben LaJoy did well. Evan Hepburn, Charlie Howard, uh, Mikkel Kokus, they all uh, placed well in, in, in state competition. And wrestling, when I recognize our wrestling coaches, uh, Coach Armstrong, Coach Tracy, Coach Dodd, Coach Overcast, Coach Rosa, Mar Rosa Marco, excuse me, and then our, our wrestling uh, athletes. Now, our wrestlers did win the state championship this year as well, and we, we got our first state championship in, uh, in our, this our long history of school, three years only, uh, but <laughs> pr pr proud of them for that. And we also had some individual state champions as well, uh, Gabe Rogers, Josh Miller, Lane Armstrong, Kara Rosa Marco, Judge Lloyd, Harrison uh, Coomton, uh, Ethan Kubal, and again, want to recognize Coach uh, Armstrong. Um, there's a lot of other athletes, and, and I just, I don't mean to take up a lot of time, but I really don't want to leave anybody out. Would you all just bear with me as I uh, run through this? And again, I apologize um, that I'm not a little bit more prepared for that. But I, I, but again, no, okay, okay, okay. Just, this is practice for graduation. So uh, again, <laughs> bear, bear with me. So. <laughs> all right. you, you delegate? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to delegate that out, but I just want to make sure I don't miss anybody else. We um, stand here. They did a lot of work. No, they, they did a phenomenal job. They, 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 they really did. And so I, I just don't want to overlook anyone um, because they, they deserve recognition. So, again, um, our men's cross-country 2A champion is Jack Arm Anstrom. Excuse me. Um, the indoor 1,000-meter champion is Will Quickie. Uh, the indoor track 3,200-meter champion is Jack Anstrom. Um, our wrestling champion, Josh Miller. Wrestling champion Lane Armstrong. Um, we have some state medalists as well. Will Quickie again, uh, placed in the state fifth place for cross country. Henry McFall, 10th place for cross country. Um, in wrestling, we had Gabe Rogers, third place. Uh, in wrestling, we also had Kira Rosa Marco, third place. Uh, wrestling, Judge Lloyd, third place. Uh, wrestling again, Ethan Kubal, third place. Uh, wrestling, Harrison Compton, fifth place. Indoor track, pole vault, Claire Morgan. Shout out to Claire Morgan. Uh, indoor chat, Will Quickie, a state champion in 1,000 meter. Uh, again, I said uh, Jack An Anstrom, again, uh, 3,200 meter in indoor track. Um, for swimming, we had the 200-yard medley relay, fourth place women. Uh, that's represented by Charlie Howard, Jay Brown, Sydney Bur Burley, Sydney here. In the uh, swim, 200-yard medley relay, second place, Jackson Vaughn, Evan Hepburn, Benjamin, Benjamin LaJoy, Colson Rogers. Also in, in swim, 200-yard freestyle, second place, Colton Roberts. Uh, the 200 uh, in IM, third place, Sydney Burley. And 500-yard uh, freestyle, second place, Colton Rogers. Forgive me, y'all. Uh, and again, 100-yard breaststroke, second place, uh, Evan Hepburn. Uh, and then in swim, 400-yard freestyle relay, second place, Benjamin LaJoy, Colton Roberts, Jackson Vaughn, and Evan Hepburn. So just want to recognize these amazing athletes. Um, thank you. Thank you. Much to be proud of with all of our schools. And thank you so much for taking the time at the evening this, this evening to uh, congratulate them. Thank you, Mr. Price. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Superintendent Jackson. I am Chris Poston, Senior Executive Director for Excellence and Opportunity, and I am here tonight to recognize um, Coach K, also Ms. Kirsten Berger. Um, Ms. Berger, can you come forward, please? 
She is our Excellence Opportunity Champion for the month of April. Um, and Excellence Opportunity, our champion aligns to pri priority three, faculty and staff. And Ms. Berger upholds the equity definition of reducing the predictability of who succeeds and who fails, um, interrupting practices that negatively impact diverse students in school settings, and cultivating the unique gifts and talents of every student. Um, I want to read what her um, nominee wrote. Um, Coach K, um, if you um, say her name, her nominee said, people will say, who's that? So everyone calls you Coach K. Mm -hmm. um, it's our excellent opportunity champion. She has become the advisor for our Black Student Union group at Seaford. This group has gone through many changes and advisors, but is truly coalescing into a strong organization within our school. She is doing an amazing job facilitating and helping them become more visible in the school, run fundraisers, organize events, and lead activities. Coach K also uses her voice to amplify student voices and to speak up when she sees inequities. Um, the relationship that she forms with the students are powerful, especially with the students with behavior issues. Students know that Coach K is there for them, and she will understand them, accept them, provide a space for them, and help them find their way to succeed at Seaforth no matter what. She also helps her colleagues understand what's going on with struggling students without violating trust, using her insight, to propose strategies to help repair or strengthen other teachers' relationships with those students. Coach K is a fierce advocate for all students, and she will always be a champion. Congratulations, um, and thank you for all you do as our excellence and opportunity and champion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, Board Members, and Dr. Jackson. I'm John Wood, the Public Information Officer. As you know, each month we select a Power of One Award recipient to be recognized during our monthly Board of Education meeting. This award falls under our strategic plan, Priority Three, Faculty and Staff, and Priority Five, Communication and Information Sharing. Recipients receive an award plaque and a small token of appreciation from one of our local sponsors, but tonight's recipient will also be the first one to receive this special Power of One pin that only Power of One Award recipients will be able to wear. It is my privilege to announce our April 2024 Power of One Award winner, Mr. Rodney Barker, lead custodian at Bennett School. One of his nominators said, Rodney Barker has been a part of the Bennett School family for over 30 years. He makes sure our school is clean and safe. He is always cleaning and helping out in any way possible. He keeps our playground clean and safe as well. Mr. Rodney has a great rapport with the staff and students. He's always smiling and greeting everyone. He often helps students carry their heavy backpacks into school. He often fills in as a father figure for those students who might not have that special someone in their lives. He personally helps me with the little things. His character and professional well-being are among the top I've ever seen. He is the very special part of Bennett School. We have often have some students even dressed like Mr. Rodney Day. <laughs> Mr. Rodney is dedicated and loved by everyone at school and in the Bennett community. Another one said, Mr. Rodney was a student at Bennett School as a child and made a career of it as our current most veteran staff member. He serves as our lead custodian as well as our most beloved faculty members by his colleagues, the community, and most importantly, the students. His impeccable attention to detail is obvious if you visit our campus. Mr. Rodney takes pride in his building and grounds and always makes sure it's in top-notch condition. But his value extends beyond the job description. He is an inspiration to us all. As a colleague, I can always count on him to lend a helping hand. He comes by on weekends or anytime there's a bad weather to make sure our campus is safe and ready for school. He is a jack of all trades who can fix anything and knows all the secrets to keeping our school at its best. For the students, Mr. Rodney stops to speak to and interact, and for many as an adult, they trust to keep them safe and always show kindness. He is patient and soft-spoken, but is also quick-witted and a friend to, to all. As a student and an employee with many years of service to CCS, he exemplifies the mission of One Chatham. Your April 2024 Power of One Award winner, Mr. Rodney Barker.
Mr. Can I interrupt one second? Yes. Ms. Trotter, you said you won't tell how many years. Mr. Many Barker, I? no, Mr. Barker was in my first seventh grade class, 1978. So uh, uh -huh. that, that ages me quite a bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, so 1978. So uh -huh. yeah, and I got to work with him when I, after uh -huh. he graduated and came back to school. We worked together too, so it worked out real, oh, really awesome. well. So. Mr. Chair, just uh, it's not on our agenda, but I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce uh, to our community and to the board our new executive director for the Chatham Education Foundation, uh, Ms. Brittany Sandifer, who's here. She's not expecting to be uh, introduced tonight, but I'd ask her to stand and be recognized. She's on the... We are so very fortunate to have a great uh, education foundation, and, and they found a new leader, and we're off and running and looking forward to great things. Thank you. That'll end my report, sir. Good to go. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll come to our public comments time, and uh, just would ask that you come up here and speak when, when your name is called. And uh, wait a minute, let me finish because I'm doing these for Mr. Ham because he wants to speak. So we give three minutes or less. So I want to make sure that I do that before he he does speak. So I knew you wanted to speak. So I just want to make sure we. No, I'm just kidding. But three minutes and timer. You're always welcome to give any notes you have or if you have what you, your comments are to uh, Ms. Sloan. She'll take care of those and get those a copy of those to us. So we appreciate that. Mr. Ham, go ahead. Well, I didn't get a microphone, so I thought that was a, a key thing. But I, I, I would like our three ladies to stand up and brag on them. They had no idea. I'm going to say this. Gary didn't know this. But in the Chatham Magazine, I didn't put an air mark on it, but uh, where, I know it's in here. I read it. Um, are we running the timer on him? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. The, uh, it, it, it's a good article. If you want to know more about them than you want to know, uh, uh, it's there. And th there's this um, one... Mr. Leonard, you'll understand this. There, there's one, one little misprint here. He only gave Dale two names. Oh. And the third name didn't get printed. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's in the Chatham Magazine if you want to oh. read it and see it. That's, That's a great honor. didn't realize that. Good job. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ham. Appreciate that tremendously. Okay, first up, uh, Tammy Trotter. Good evening, Mr. Chair, board members, Dr. Jackson, and the whole leadership team. We've had lots of celebrations tonight, but I think we need to celebrate you and your hard work also. As a parent who has three Chatham County kids that have graduated and gone on, um, as a volunteer in the schools and as a teacher in the schools. I appreciate all that you've done. I really appreciate the relationship that you guys have with our commissioners. It's like none other. And that, as a teacher, I'm very appreciative of. As a parent, I'm appreciative of. And as a resident of Chatham County, I'm appreciative of. Um, so I really just wanted to say thank you to all of you. And please know that all the petition and the negativity doesn't embrace all of us. We don't all embrace it. Um, it's not just our commissioner's responsibility to fund our salaries that the state should be doing a much better job at. It's at the legislative level and we need that's where it needs to be taken to and that's where our energy needs to be focused. So I just want to thank all of you for all that you do for Chatham County Schools. Not just the kids, but the faculty, the staff, everybody, the community at large. So thank you. Uh, Anna Blair. Okay. 
Ms. Blair, joining me? Okay. Uh, Anthony Santiago. Uh, hello, good afternoon, members of the board and superintendent, Dr. Jackson. My name is Anthony Santiago Hernandez, and I am a senior at Jordan Matthews High School. As a student who frequently attends these meetings, I see the value they hold in the information that both students and parents can learn. If I could give a suggestion, though, then something that I think these meetings can improve on is increasing the access to accurate information in Spanish. This can be done by translating the agenda and board materials in Spanish, as currently they are provided in English only and by acquiring additional certified translators to assist in translation as to lessen the load during these prolonged meetings. I believe that these improvements I have suggested be of great benefit to the Hispanic parents that attend these meetings and the many more to come. Thank you for your time and consideration and have a great rest of your school year. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Araceli Ortega. Buenas tardes a todos ustedes. Uh, mi nombre es Araceli Ortega y he vivido aquí en Chatham County por 27 años. One second. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I knew she was coming. I was just looking to see <laughs> where you're going. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Araceli Ortega. Good afternoon. My name is Araceli Ortega. Es un placer poder estar aquí con todos ustedes esta hermosa tarde. It's a pleasure and wanted to be here with all this uh, beautiful afternoon. Porque tengo muchas cosas que agradecer a Chatham County Schools. Because there's a lot of things I want to thank Chatham, Chatham County Schools for. He vivido aquí por 27 años y tengo tres hermosos hijos, excelentes hijos. I've been living here for 27 years, and I have tres. I have three um, children that attend here. Sí, me, quiero darle las gracias en, me, bueno, a todas las escuelas y a um, Silas City Elementary School porque tienen un excelente programa bilingüe. Um, I would like to thank all the schools, especially Silas City Elementary, because of their uh, dual language program. Ahora tengo una hija que está trabajando para Second Room de Pittsburgh, traduciendo documentos. Gracias, Elementary School, por su programa bilingüe. And because of that, I now have a daughter that works for Second Room, and I am grateful. Y gracias también a, a Charan Miro y a Jordan Matthews por sus programas de deportes. De, de música, eso es muy bueno para, en otras cosas, sino en, la, en los programas de las escuelas. I would also like to thank Chatham Middle and Jordan Matthews because of their excellent sports programs and their arts programs because my son um, can go to Tequila está, está involucrado he's en really cosas involved, positivas y buenas involved, de los deportes. He's involved in positive things instead of being focused on other things. Y también gracias a CCC College por darme la oportunidad de obtener mi GED y las clases de computación que fueron muy necesarias ahora las estoy aprovechando en mi trabajo. Gracias. Uh, I also want to thank, thank CCCC. Um, thanks to them, I was able to get my GED and I am now taking or taking advantage of taking this computer class right now. Muchas gracias también. Uh, quiero darle las gracias por el servicio uh, de interpretación que tienen esta tarde aquí. Uh, yo creo que esto va a traer a más papás hispanohablantes para poder venir a platicar con ustedes nuestras preocupaciones, nuestras opiniones para a cómo mejorar nuestros estudiantes, nuestros jóvenes. Um, I would also like to thank you all for having interpreting services like right now, today. Um, uh, and I hope it brings more Hispanic speaking families here to have more of an open dialogue with you all. Para venir a platicar las preocupaciones de nuestros hijos con ellos. To speak more about their worries um, and about their problems. Ah, también me gustaría que uh, en un futuro hubiese um, esa oportunidad de que pudiéramos firmar en línea porque a veces no puedo venir a registrarme a las cinco y media por mi trabajo. Entonces, me gustaría que si lo podemos algún día hacer en línea. 
Um, I would also like for there to be an online service where you can sign up to have an account or public comment. Um, because sometimes she doesn't have time or I don't have time to come okay. in person to sign. Hay también, ah, pues gracias al vínculo hispano por involucrar a nuestros jóvenes en sus programas. Uh, eh, I would also like to thank the Hispanic liaison for um, getting our youth involved. Porque pues tenemos que crear um, jóvenes que aporten algo a la comunidad, algo positivo. Because we have to raise children that will um, in invest back into their community. Muchas gracias por escucharme. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll move along to our information items, uh, social media litigation. Uh, Ward Blacklaw, Dr. Jackson, and Ms. Emily Beeson. Ward Blacklaw. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Jackson. Thank you for having me this evening. Um, my name is Emily Beeson. I'm an attorney with Ward Black Law in Greensboro, uh, and I'm here to uh, talk to you about what is a very important and growing epidemic in our country. Um, I don't know who's calling up the slides here. I can go along with them, or I can just ad lib. You can add lib if you want. Sure. That'd be fine. Okay. Yeah, I think you've all received some information about the litigation already. Um, but the bottom line of it is that the social media companies such as Snapchat, TikTok, Facebook, um, even Google and YouTube uh, are designed in such a way that they're causing addiction among uh, everyone, but in particular school age children. Uh, the designers of these programs um, have taken advantage of the um, attributes of developing brains that are easily addicted to uh, the, the types of triggers that they create. Uh, so they have the endless scroll option. They have uh, disappearing posts so that students are fearful that they're going to miss out on something if they're not constantly checking their uh, accounts. Because of these addictive uh, qualities of the programs, some students and individuals are experiencing an increase in mental health crises. Uh, there have been peer-reviewed publications that have shown that use of these social media products have caused increases in anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, um, eating disorders. There's also the problem with um, the challenges and things like that that uh, arise on these platforms where students are causing disruptions in schools. Uh, trying to video and get get posts going on the different platforms to feel like they're being a part of um, those challenges. Uh, but the if you can go on to the next slide. Again, the the problem with these platforms is the design. The designers knew about the addictive nature of these particular features that are listed on the screen here, among others. Uh, they've made public statements where they acknowledge the addictive nature of the programs. Uh, next slide, please. The defendants are familiar names to all of you, I'm sure. Facebook owner, Meta. Um, TikTok owner, ByteDance. Snapchat owner, Snap. And Google, who's the owner of YouTube. Um, next slide, please. The reason that school boards across the country are getting involved in litigation regarding these problems uh, with the platforms uh, is because it's another avenue for us to hold these companies accountable for the disruptions that they've caused in our schools across the country. Um, school boards, you know, school districts house students for a lot of time during the day. These students are um, spending a lot of time at school. They are dis disrupting the school system and the, the educational mission of the schools uh, when they suffer from these health crises, when they're impacted by friends who are suffering from these health crises, mental health crises, and when they are um, being disruptive to participate in these addictive platforms. Um, through litigation, we can help to change the social media company's behavior 
uh, to require them to put in place certain safeguards um, that will prevent this problem from growing. Uh, in addition, by school boards bringing these actions, we can ensure that any compensation goes directly to the school district. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, again, the diversion of, of resources during the school day and outside of the school day, even at, at um, extracurricular functions, um, is really the types of damages that we're seeking to, to uh, compensation for. Uh, so resources to address mental health needs, um, resources to educate students and um, the community about the addictive nature and try to um, abate these problems from growing. Um, if you can go to the next slide. A lot of times people associate litigation with a lot of cost. In this particular circumstance, uh, there is very low financial risk. Uh, we have circulated a retainer agreement uh, that demonstrates our, our contingency fee agreement uh, for representing the school board is 25%. Uh, we are only compensated if we're able to secure a positive recovery for the school system. Um, and the in investment of time and resources from the school system to comply with the litigation requirements is really low. Um, there is a little bit of discovery. It's a plaintiff fact sheet that's a few pages long, a uh, few dozen questions. It would require a day or two of working, of, of you know, one administrator working with uh, one of the attorneys from our team to collect some information. A lot of it's information that you would already be collecting anyway. Um, so in our view, this is a, a no-lose situation. If we're not successful, we, you don't owe us anything. If you are successful, then all of the money um, that we, would be allocated to the school would be sent you know, back in, in the community um, rather than going to any other kind of earmarked places. You can go to the next slide, please. Uh, so the litigation has been consolidated in California, but you would have North Carolina attorneys filing the lawsuit here in North Carolina, and we will be working with um, a team of attorneys located in Baltimore and California um, to move forward with the litigation. And with that, you can go to the next slide. Um, our team consists of Ward Black Law in Greensboro, uh, Baird Mandalas out of Baltimore, and Leaf Cabraser out of California. Leaf Cabraser um, is a powerhouse in this type of litigation, and they, um, one of the members of our team is actually on the steering committee. She's co-lead counsel, um, so very in touch with what's going on and, and what the needs are um, of the litigation. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Currently, we represent a large number of school districts uh, across the country, but in particular in North Carolina, we have a couple of dozen um, school boards that we're representing in this litigation. Next slide. Um, this is not an unprecedented type of claim. So previously, the opioid and jewel cases um, have been brought by similar entities, school boards and municipalities, um, with billions of dollars being, um, you know, settlements of billions of dollars being reached and that money going directly to the school boards who did bring claims in the, in the litigation. Um, so with that, I can take any questions, um, but I would ask that, you know, hopefully you guys will approve um, participating in the litigation as well as approving the retainer with our litigation team. So um, could you, um, I th it seems like there, in addition to the financial amount, that there were certain asks of social media to, for changes to be made. Yes, ma'am. Could you articulate those? I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. Could you articulate the changes that would be asked of this if the litigation is successful? I can speak generally to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the safeguards that are not in place, such as age verification, um, parental controls, things like that, would be one of the asks, is that these social media companies do a better job of putting them in place and regulating them, making sure that they work. Um, another is that the algorithm designs are not made in such a way, and that's that's beyond my knowledge, and you know, I don't know algorithm speak, uh, but so that they're not designed in such a way as to be so addictive to children. Because I think that stood out um, when we spoke with someone from the staff before that that the algorithms were particularly targeting right. of children, and that the algorithms contributed to that. So thanks for changing the algorithms, again, so that they're not uh, quite tar targeted to the degree that they right. are 
is sounded compelling. Right, the targeting, and it's like cyclical. So if a if a person is searching for a certain thing, it will continue to pop up in their feed after they are have stopped searching for it. So if they're searching something about depression, even after they've stopped that search, it will continue to cycle around to them, um, which kind of further pushes them into that spiral. If if um, if the suit is successful and there is money given and it comes to Chatham County, will there be any restrictions on how the money is used by the school system? Sure. Um, typically, we do not see that. Um, frequently with uh, attorney general cases, I think you know they can be earmarked, but with the Jewel cases, for example, where we represented some school boards, there was no requirement for how the funds were used. Are any of the attorney generals involved? Or Yes. Um, North Carolina Attorney General Josh Stein is a member of you know, a group of many, many um, AGs across the country who are also involved in the litigation. They're separate claims um, seeking different remedies. Any other questions? And we approved this at our last meeting. Uh, we had, had spoken to a member of the firm before in closed session, and we wanted the public just to know what we were doing. So. That's what this is for. So it's our the board has already approved that we would be part of the litigation itself. So this was informational. So does anybody else have any any questions? Thank you, Ms. Beeson, for being here. We time. appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Item B under information is uh, the North Carolina School Board Association board policy. Manual update, 4,000 series A. Of course, this is first reading, and Dr. Moran, I see you up here ready to go. So this item aligns with really all of our strategic plan priority areas. As you may recall, our district recently worked with the North Carolina School Boards Association to conduct an audit of our full policy manual. We will be bringing a segment of policies to be reviewed or approved each month. So how that will work, we will be bringing one set of policies for the first reading, and at the same time, we may have the previous months um, up for approval that month. So in other words, um, you have a lot of homework for the foreseeable future um, with these updates. The policy update tonight contains 44 policies for review, um, and these came straight from our audit of our policies. The 4000 series is about students, and so it's one of our larger policy areas and it has been split into two segments. So this is 4000 Series A. Some of the policies require minor changes with slight wording shifts, and some of the policies require larger revisions based off of those legal updates. And Mr. Swankle, if you can scroll down and pull up the correlation chart, keep going. Um, correlation table. I wanted just to show you the structure that we'll be using each month because this will really be going on for, is it, full, about a year to get through all of our policies. So we just wanted to show you kind of the process that we'll use. You'll get a table like this each month, and it shows the policy that was reviewed and the current status. If the item is in green, it means that it is currently um, in accordance with this, the school board's association policy, so it's completely updated. If it shows that it is in yellow, it means that the policy is not included in the NCSBA policy. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. That could be that it's one of our regulations that we've chosen to add behind school board association policy. Or it could be a policy that we've added for some reason in Chatham, and we would have to determine if we want to keep that. Items that are in red are items that the school board's association would like for us to um, repeal or remove from our policy manual. Um, I think there are only maybe one or two of those, and they were out of date. Items in orange have been recommended by the School Boards Association to be held for a later, later date. If you know in our policy manual, some of our policies have dual numbers, so they're in multiple policy sections. So usually if you see that in orange, they want us to hold it until we get to that other policy area. The folders that are also included that are linked have all of the policies with strike through, so you can see the exact changes in each of the policies that um, are being recommended. Any questions about the process that we will be using to kind of go through this work with you? So, um, the 
the discrimination and harassment section, can you articulate what change they want in that? Sure. So um, I'm going to have Mr. Um, Blyce and Ms. Tracy Fowler. They will come up and be willing to answer any questions you may have about some of the changes. Um, the other thing that I will point out is in the table, you'll notice in the third column, it'll say notes for consideration. That tells you specifically what the School Boards Association has requested to be changed in a particular policy, kind of in bulleted format. And then if you actually go into the policy, you can see the exact um, strikeouts and wording shifts. So I'll have them come up, but I'm also um, happy to answer any questions you have about the structure or the process that we're using. You're talking about the Title IX discrimination pieces there? Is that mm -hmm. what you're speaking yes. to? Yes, uh, 1710 there yeah. at the bottom of the first page. No, it's the other one. Um, is that the one? Um, it's the, the first, the pink one. Um, What's the number? Oh, it's number um, 7104072030-5. So that one is a regulation? That is that is a local regulation. That is not a policy. That's the, so what she's saying is that she doesn't have any recommendations for that piece. So okay. that's something that we'll have to look at locally. Yeah. Okay. So okay. all of these things are the ones that are coming from the School Board Association recommendations. Correct. And so you have, a, again, a month to review, but mm -hmm. this is a process to, to do that. Okay. And once you feel like you have to do that, then we'll do yeah. that. That's all. I just wanted clarification about what that meant. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Item C, Artificial Intelligence State Guidance and uh, Chatham County Schools Implementation, Dr. Moran. So this agenda item aligns with priorities one, two, three, and five of our strategic plan. Um, and the presentation this evening is really intended to give our stakeholders and, of course, the board um, some of the efforts that our district has taken to remain at the forefront of artificial intelligence developments and how some of these tools could enhance teaching and learning in our district. With that said, we do want to explore the use of AI and how it can enhance learning for our students and our, our staff. However, we also at the same time want to preserve the human element of our classrooms. So um, we understand that teachers matter and the most important part of quality instruction is a high quality teacher in the classroom. So we want to make sure that we're balancing that work. Another disclaimer about AI is that the guidance that we're developing, even some of the things we share with you today, um, things are rapidly changing in this, work, in this work. And so even since the last time we presented at our Parent Academy session, some things have changed even since that time. So just know that this work is not going to be one and done. It will be kind of a continual evolving process. As far as any financial impact, we don't have any particular um, ask at this point. Um, we have applied for quite a few digital learning grants that have a focus on AI. And if we are funded with those grants, which we hope to find out very soon, um, we'll use those funds to help support the professional development that we have in store, um, as well as any other types of um, materials or subscriptions we might want to utilize. Um, currently, we're using digital learning funds and local professional development funds to support this work. And uh, Mr. Swankle, if you can pull up the AI implementation timeline. We wanted to be really transparent um, with folks about kind of the work that we're doing and why it's important. Um, and if you'll scroll up a little bit, you can see some of our timeline, the various action steps that we're taking on kind of staying um, ahead of this work. Keep going down. We also have um, the various supports and contacts that we're making. Um, the folks here at the district who are doing this work who at the Department of Public Instruction is leading this work, and then other entities that we are collaborating with. So if you'll keep scrolling, um, you'll hear Dr. Berggren talk about work with UNC, our TIP uh, partners, keep going, Friday Institute, ISTE, um, and more. And so we are working really hard to provide a variety of professional development sessions. You can see those here. And we're also kind of archiving resources um, here in this, in this timeline. So this is really just a, a just to show you kind of we have a, a project map of how we're kind of rolling this work out and it will be ongoing. 
Um, I'm now going to ask Dr. Kira Berggren to come up. She is our Director for Digital Teaching and Learning and Media Programs, and really she's becoming quite um, a forefront or leader in this work in AI. She was recently um, selected by the Department of Public Instruction to serve on the DPI AI Collaborative Team, which was a selective process, and she's also recently presented to our PTEC partners um, as well. And so she's going to give you a quick overview of some things we've shared with parents and even with students. Um, and we'll be here to answer any questions after that. Dr. Bergman. Good evening, board members, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Jackson. I hope everyone is doing well this evening. And yes, I'm really excited to present to you all some information about artificial intelligence and what we are hoping at the instructional level at Chatham County Schools to utilize with it with regard to educating our students. So, um, Mr. Swankle, if you will please, uh, yep. This Beginner's Guide to Artificial Intelligence is a brief summary of what we presented to parents at our Parent Academy in January. And if you'll go to the next slide. These are just a few things that we have been doing as the, the ACES uh, instructional team to keep at the forefront of these very rapidly changing advancements. Um, one of the things that I wanted to point out in this was uh, Chatham County participated as beta testers for ChatGPT4 and other AI tools. Uh, one of them is very new, and it is the ISTE. Let me look it up real quick. It's ISTE Stretch AI. So if you're familiar with the International Society for Technology and Education, this particular AI tool is going to only search within all of the credible resources that ISTE provides for when professionals log into their account. We all know that uh, teachers all are ISTE members in North Carolina, thanks to DPI for the second year in a row. So instead of just pulling all kinds of information from all over the web, it's going to pull specific things that have been um, credible and approved by ISTE. The objectives that we have here are the same objectives that we shared with the parents at the Night of the Parent Academy. They are also the objectives that we are going to share at our next professional development, which is on the School Professional Development Day later this month for high school teachers. So this will all be aligned and transparent. A brief overview of what AI is. We all have heard the terms artificial intelligent or AI at this point. So just a quick overview of what we're talking about here. Some common terms that you might hear when you are out and about in the community or when you're out and about in the schools. Uh, referring to generative AI, these are the tools that uh, produce new products with the touch of a button or um, AI literacy, the ability to use artificial intelligence in, in a way that is productive but also ethical. Okay, this is a more fun slide. I was going to give a couple of examples and then we talked about social media algorithms a moment ago. So I figured I would use that one instead since that's kind of fresh on our minds. So if you've ever been talking about a product that you've been interested in trying just in conversation at lunch and then you open up whatever social media platform you enjoy using and right there is an advertisement for that product you were just talking about. You are a victim of artificial intelligence. That is social media using their special algorithms, which are not new, we've actually had since 2003, but they have put them in place in order to personalize content for its users. So some of the things that we are going to be discussing with our teachers and staff in the upcoming months is how might AI be used in education? And that includes the advances and the pitfalls. But with regard to advances, one of our foci when we talk about AI is what are the positives of it for the use by our students. So these are just a few things that were collected by DPI. Um, they also were confirmed by our student advisory group on how, how the students use AI for, for school. Some additional example pro uh, prompts that students might use. So if they're working on projects, they need help uh, proofreading an essay, or they're going on a job interview and they want to predict what the employer might ask of them, there are countless uh, prompts that you can use with AI. 
Continuing the discussion with AI in education uh, from a more educational perspective. These resources are from DPI, from their uh, recommendations that they recently came out with in late January. So these guidances would be used for both educators and for students on what are some appropriate ways to use AI and what are some inappropriate ways to use AI. Um, similar to when the internet first came out and students were using the internet to help them with their research projects and we were checking and making sure that they weren't plagiarizing and that whole, that whole, um, all of that came about. So. Uh, there's a lot of ways that AI can be used uh, with regard to that too. So it's our job as educators to prepare our students for using AI in a way that's ethical because the data shows that by 2027, AI is going to be very heavily involved in um, all corporations' jobs. So we want to prepare our students for that future. So like Dr. Moran said, AI has been rapidly changing. When we talked to parents back in January, this was just an example tool that we were going to use. We did adapt this from the DPI recommendations. Uh, I believe this one is actually directly from DPI. But we took that and we chatomized it, so I'll show you an example of that in just a bit. We can go ahead and go to the next document. Some additional resources at the end for you, including Dr. Jackson's article on AI, which is very good. Definitely check it out. Um, let's go ahead and go to the <laughs> Handbook of AI Pedagogies draft. Coming up with a title for this particular working document is incredibly challenging because we don't want to use terms like guidelines or procedures or policies because that's not how DPI is phrasing it right because this is so new it's impossible to create a law behind artificial intelligence use in the classroom. So we prefer terms like pedagogies, suggestions, considerations, recommendations, things that are a little softer so folks don't feel like they have to do it this way or they have to do it that way. Um, this particular cover art was generated by ChatGPT4. I really liked how it had a Chatham slash steampunk vibe to it. You'll see that again later on, hint, hint. Let's go all the way to the appendices, please. So a couple of resources that the ACES and uh, digital learning teams have put together as part of this document. One of them is the Every Framework which DPI came up with and we took it and combined it with the ISTE standards. So we created one for both the student standards and one for the teacher standards. And if you were to click on the interactive version of this document, each one of those links will either take you to an article or to a brief video explaining how the two correlate, uh, whether you are a teacher or a student. We scroll down two pages. So I mentioned the graphic that we had just a bit ago that looks kind of like a traffic light, right? This is the first draft of a Chatham County Schools version of that, and it's broken down into three components as opposed to five. We felt like that would make it a little bit easier to follow. This is something that is in the heavy draft phase, and we did, this is actually our second time sharing it with someone. Our first time was with our Student Advisory Council to get some constructive feedback from our student leaders. And aside from some word changes and some phrase changes for clarification, um, they were pretty like spot on with what we thought that they would enjoy from this rubric. So they thought that overall it would be useful for classroom implementation. So we are going to continue collecting some teacher feedback with regard to it, but we're hoping to maybe implement it or something similar to it for the fall. Uh, next, uh, if you scroll down a little bit, oh, you can pass that. Some common terms, we've talked about those before. Scroll past that. I actually think that's all I have for you, aside from some um, additional resources and further AI tools that are being used. There are new ones constantly cropping up every day. LinkedIn just came up with an article of the top 100 AI tools being used, so more on the way. <laughs> 
pretty much an AI for everything that you can think of. If you want to create a poem, if you want to make a song, we made a song recently for our Young Authors program. It's pretty awesome. Sounds like an actual human is singing it, but it's really a bot. So I'll take any questions if you have them. Oh, I did have a question. How are teachers able to determine if AI might have been used by a student when they're not there? One way would be if a student, like as like an English teacher, for example, they get to know how a student writes, right, their voice after a couple of times that they submit something. So then all of a sudden they submit something that's really polished or beyond their grade level or uses vocabulary words that they've never used before. That might be a hint. Um, additionally, we, in normal cases, would suggest using some kind of copyright tool, but the issue with that is that they're so unreliable, sometimes you get a false positive. Yes, this child copied this information, or no, they're totally good. So we don't recommend that, but um, we do recommend just getting to know your students, their style, their learning techniques, and um, personalize your learning and developing those relationships so you can be a model for those students so they don't do that. And a sure. I had just real, oh, sorry. I was going to say, the other thing I would just add to that is all of our students have their Chromebooks, and we are a Google district, and so we are recommending that our teachers ask students to show their work. So if students are logging their work and using those Google documents, they should be able to see in the revision history at any time if a student has dropped in a large body of text. Um, and so, and we've, we've run into having to support uh, a few schools with some of those scenarios. And sometimes the students are able to show us the work and sometimes they've not been able to do that. Um, and so I think it's individual conversations and um, like Dr. Bergen mentioned, knowing um, your students. Yeah, the um, comment I was gonna make is that I hadn't really considered the positives of using AI for kids. And so it was nice to see how you lifted out. And I hadn't thought about that before. So I can see how we're moving into a new era and get adapted to it. It's not going away. It's not going away. <laughs> We had students on our student advisory council, um, some who had really not ever used it or didn't realize they were using it, to um, one student who had presented at um, a TED talk about AI and in front of thousands of people. So we had students who were creating music and creating art, and um, you know, it's there are some really great opportunities for our students. We just have to help our teachers balance um, that ethical use. And I have a quick just language question because you know I think you know AI to me is like a huge umbrella. And ever since ChatGPT was launched, it seems like AI in the in conversations has come to mean you know that degenerative stuff. But it's also used for predictive analytics and all sorts of things that our students might want to learn about in that context. And you know because I you know there are people close by here, maybe part of the community that use use AI data to work on public health issues and to identify new treatments for diseases and things like that. So it's not all you know, AI doesn't equal chat GBT type things. So are we are we doing things, I guess, in, in curriculum to prepare students to use, you know, AI in that mathematical, statistical context too? Sure, um, and one of the things that we're using very closely are the DPI recommendations because they do have some really good resources on tying AI into curriculum at the end of their document. Um, additionally, we are, well, oh my gosh, we're doing so many things. Um, I was trying to think of something specific off the top of my head, but I will come back to you on that one. <laughs> One thing that I neglected to mention earlier is that um, North Carolina is one of only a handful of states um, who, is it four? Four who have any type of guidance at the state level for the use of AI um, in education. So. Um, we like to think that Chatham's on the forefront, but we certainly appreciate the guidance that we're getting um, from the state. It is um, certainly an evolving process. Any other? I don't have any questions, but I feel like I need to say this. Probably everybody in this room is probably 20 to 30 years younger than me. So this comes from an old school perspective, but I'm, I'm going to say this. When the children got all caught up in computers and what have you, started relying on calculators, complete computers, and so on and so forth. The emphasis on knowing how to do it from scratch was lost. So I'm looking at this now. I'm scared to death of the stuff because people don't seem to understand the enormity of it and what can actually happen. And I'm, I mean, did everybody in this room see Terminator? That's real. <laughs> That's real. 
Ms. Turner, you're absolutely correct. Like this is the next calculator. This is the next piece of information. Absolutely. It is going to resonate with every every person in every bit of education. In, in a lot of the work that we're seeing coming from DPI and some of our business partners, um, some of these AI skills are some of the top skills that they're wanting our students to have for the workforce. One of the um, fastest growing jobs is an AI prompter, someone who just literally comes up with the types of prompts to generate AI to do whatever task you're wanting it to do. So those are the types of jobs that we're needing to prepare our students for. But on the flip side, and I started with this, I agree with you 100%, Ms. Turner, that we also have to balance the fact that we have to teach students basic skills and we have to balance the fact that we have a human in the classroom and we need to make sure that we're honoring that human and, and that teacher and that student. So what you'll notice tonight when we present a little bit later about our um, language arts curriculum that we're adopting, um, it really is all about basics. It's all about language arts and its core. And it's not a digital tool. It's not something that is a student, you know, sitting at a computer. Um, and so I think we have to kind of have that nice balance of preparing our kids for the future, but also having those basic skills that we know our stu students have to have. Okay, as long as I can trust you all to do that, it's fine. <laughs> We're, we're actually going to use that balance to reassure our edu our educators that AI is not going to replace their jobs. It is going to complement their jobs and probably save them a little bit of time, too. That's right. Mr. Dale, to, to piggyback on what you're talking about, the, the old school uh, of junior year at North was if, if you brought a calculator to school and the clock was a, it was a three-day suspension, still using slide rules. Exactly. <laughs> so times change. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Item D, proposed academic calendar for 25-26. Dr. Batten, please. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Superintendent Jackson. I'm Dr. Kelly Batten, Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources, and this presentation was not generated using AI. <laughs> uh, anytime we speak about the calendar, we'd like to start with a review of the public school calendar requirements. We have added this sheet that you see displayed to our district website in the calendar section. Um, during the process this year with our calendar committee and also our survey of community members, we realized it was important to continue to share this information because it was an ongoing, um, really, community education as it pertains to the requirements from the state for the calendar law. The calendar law has been in place in North Carolina for approximately 20 years. So for um, those that are new to public education in our state, they may not be as familiar with really the, the rules of the calendar game. As you see displayed on the screen, I'll highlight a few items. Uh, the calendar, it speaks both to the instructional schedule for students and the employment calendar for staff. That includes starting for students no earlier than the Monday closest to August 26th and must end for students no later than the Friday closest to June 11th. And we promise parents we're not trying to keep their students longer. This is part of the state law. The length of the school year, um, we can be based on hours or 185 instructional days. Chatham County has used instructional hours um, for the past several years. As far as the employment calendar for teachers and staff, you'll see it includes specific parameters that are applied statewide to public schools, containing a total number of 215 days of employment, at least nine teacher work days, at least 10 annual leave days, and the same or equivalent legal holidays that are designated for all state employees. School also cannot be scheduled for employees on Veterans Day or <coughs> Sundays. Veterans Day is one that um, we, we often get questions from uh, parents, you know, why, why is a holiday in the middle of the week? Why would we take a work day in the middle of the week? And this is a, an example. Veterans Day is, is not a holiday that sticks to one day of, of the week. Um, included with this is also our board policy 3300, so this is where that information is also listed. That's another resource that the public can use to reference that. Our calendar committee also revisits each year some local priorities, and you'll see that the very first thing that the calendar committee states each year is we want to protect time for student learning and an accurate assessment of student achievement. 
at all times the calendar needs to support that. That needs to be the focus. As you go through our local priorities, you'll see that there's a commitment to time for professional development as a way to invest in teachers. And we've started to hear anecdotally from staff who visit with us from other school systems who begin to take a look at Chatham. They do express a real interest in the option to have additional work days. While this is not a monetary compensation for staff in this day and age, it is something that new graduates ask. They ask about support and then new staff members who are looking to join Chatham County Schools, they do look for what is the extent of support that they can reach. We'll go on to the 2024-25 calendar. We'll remind everyone that last year we approved two calendars, the 23-24 and the 24-25 calendar. So the calendar you see displayed was previously approved. We came back to this as a calendar committee so we could designate officially work days that were required district-wide for professional development or for school-based. And if you scroll down, just as an example, we have those now included on this document. So when we bring this back to you next month, it can be um, take action for approval, and then we will repost this version, and then families and staff will be able to know specifically which of the already designated work days are district PD or for school-based PD. We've also completed the same for the Chatham Early College, so that information will be included as well for the public <coughs> beginning next month. If we go to the draft calendar for 2526, not that one, that one, there we go. This is the information that was shared during the survey. Draft B was the preferred calendar. The drafts that were presented um, held a similar format to what we've seen for 23-24 and 24-25. The difference primarily with draft B is to take into account other religious observances. This was feedback from our community in the past to be more open, more strategic, um, to practice equity, to practice diversity, to practice inclusion. And so this calendar strategically places work days so that we can be more inclusive of our growing um, and diverse community. And so that's the primary difference between this calendar and um, the previous draft that we had for this. Uh, it has slightly fewer total work days. And again, that what plays into that is the placement of some of the other holidays, the placement of um, Veterans Day, some pieces like that. This calendar continues to support our partnership with the Chatham County Board of Elections to use the general election date in November and a primary election date as teacher work days. This provides flexibility so um, students could certainly vote, staff could vote, but also our schools could be used as polling locations. So that's also a reason we communicate with families why we would have um, in November, November 4th, as a teacher work day. We'd like to look at the survey feedback just to give you a sense of what's on the minds of our community. That'll be our last document that we'll go through tonight. Um, as we go through this, you know, annually we provide the survey. Um, we have anywhere this year about 500, um, just over 500 responses. Some years we've had over 700, just kind of depending on the nature of the survey. A little more participation last year because we were asking about two years. So we had um, an increase in the interest. We'd love to have more students who would actually uh, participate. So that's, that's a piece that uh, we would love to see more of that. But um, parents and employees certainly being the two biggest categories that are represented. We use some word clouds here, and, and I'll keep um, pointing out some key features of these rather than having a running list of the comments. Our calendar committee reviewed the comments, and so we have some key points that we want to share. This particular word cloud is merely representing um, what were their thoughts about the 2526 calendar, strategic placement of work days, reduction of early release days, reducing midweek interruptions for working families, and um, including this observance of religious holidays. Those were all things that were appreciated as um, survey participants um, looked at that option. If we go to the next slide, this is just what the end result really was. Draft calendar B being preferred of the two. And again, 
the primary difference there taking into account a more inclusive approach to how we place those work days around the religious observances. In the next slide, the portion of the survey, we wanted to know in general, what were people's thoughts about uh, 2324 and 2425 in terms of positives, the strategic use of work days during this school year, uh, attempting to maintain a balance of semesters. Uh, those were themes that pulled out of that. The um, the next word cloud really uh, you'll see it's all the same words right um, so um, to eat apples and, and oranges from what were things we could improve from this current year and really we can we can really summarize that there's a couple words that you do see in that cloud one is January uh, the month of January um, that came up also the month of November that doesn't show up in the actual cloud but January came up this survey was administered in February and so we knew we were right on the, the heels of getting feedback around um, what school, what was going on with the calendar there. And there's just continued interest, and this has been each year with the calendar, in avoiding a choppy November and avoiding a choppy January. Um, and we'll, legislation could help us with that. <laughs> yeah. help us on that. Yeah. They could help us there. Again, this was not generated by AI. So um, <laughs> another, another piece that came up, there were... There were, again, concerns if there were midweek breaks, and some of that was, again, our own public education, that Veterans Day that's required by the state that we use that, and that moves. Um, so that was, that was a piece. Well, the election too? Tuesday. The election Tuesday as well. So this particular slide, this is one we can all agree on. So as you can see by this, the question asked, you know, hey, when should we place work days? Uh, Mondays and Fridays, you know, so this, again, further supports our interest in trying to maximize for working families, ability to set up, um, whether it's vacations or child care. And so that was consistent. And that's one that we really tried to honor um, throughout the draft calendar. If we go to the next, the next one, uh, this one I, I think really speaks volumes to um, my own life as a parent, and that is an educator. Uh, for the first day of school, do you have a preferred start day? Uh, we didn't tease this out, but we anecdotally have reason to believe teachers would vote Wednesday and parents would vote Monday. Yep. Um, but that's that, again, is one, depending on the year, how quickly we can start. And just um, always thinking strategically, we have delayed starts for kindergartners to roll in. Um, but this was this was good information, again, to have feedback. In general, I'll tell you that the calendar committee prefers to start around Wednesday, that's considered to be sort of the, the sweet spot for having a couple of work days to start that week and then bringing um, students back in and getting them back underway. This next piece of information, we are now all on a nine weeks grading period, K-12. If you start at the 18% um, burgundy piece, that would be a response that um, placement of spring break is not important at all, then go around clockwise. What this really helps support is the fact that with all schools now on a nine weeks grading period, being strategic about placing spring break at the end of that third nine weeks is favored by our community. And so that's something that we've continued with each of our proposed calendars. Um, the great survey question. AI can't do better than this one um, with this next question, which is, was there any interest in the community, any interest amongst employees in an alternative spring break? Spring break is actually one thing that is not mandated in the calendar law, whether the length of time, the placement, how it's used. So to help us with future planning, a question was asked on the survey if there was interest in breaking up a traditional one week spring break into a series of three or four day weekends. And by choosing uh, no, that was a definitive no, um, based on what you see at the, um, with number one. That, that was definitely a hands-off spring break. So we, we won't mess with that in the proposals. The final topic, uh, yes, sir. Um, one feedback that I've received over the last couple of years that's been very positive is the work day after spring break. And I would think from a teacher perspective, it's okay, I'll be gone a week, and I don't have to work on all day Sunday to get ready for Monday. I can be off all week and then have 
Monday they pull everything together. Absolutely. The, the calendar committee, in fact, one of the standing pieces they attempt to do is after a long break to have that type of uh, work day plugged in there. Absolutely. The final topic really centers around um, the balancing of semesters. So the strongest feedback is going to be from high school students, families, and uh, high school staff because of the placement of high school exams. So you can see here there is an interest in high school exams before winter break, but there's a lot of no preference, a lot of does not apply. And that, again, speaks to the groups that are um, affected by it mostly, which is our high schools. In the next slide, um, we looked at playing around with some other options. So again, January and November, typically those are the two months we hear the, the strongest feedback about as far as the choppiness um, and the consistency. So we looked at some other districts and models of having a full week at Thanksgiving break, knowing that this would cut into our ability to balance the two semesters. And um, the balancing of the semesters emerged as a higher priority. So that, that was good feedback just to be able to see if there was an interest in that. These, these final two pieces of data I'll share, we did some cross comparisons just with the survey participants we had. And again, this isn't everyone in Chatham County, but for this particular survey, what you can see um, in the purple section, we just broke apart. So calendar A, calendar B, depending on people's preference. And what did they prefer about balanced semesters? What did they prefer about high school exams before winter break? And you'll see that, you know, those, there is this interest, if we even look at just calendar B, uh, being able to put high school exams before winter break, you know, that continues to emerge as a topic for um, exploration. This next one, so yes. How, how, much, how much did they get better off? If, if you take into account, it is at least 10 to 15 days. Because if you think about now, we're doing exams, it's around the 16th of January, right in there. So it would be anywhere from 10 to 15 school days. Mm -hmm. The, um, this, yeah, this one here, just, yes, this was just looking at um, people's relationship, what they, who they identified as when they completed the survey, and you'll see for parents there was this interest in high school exams for foreign break, and also for employees there was a bit of a preference there. So all, all in all, that is of interest, but being able to balance the semesters out still um, gets significant. The final little word cloud, I'll, I'll point out, I just want to point out two things really from that. And this, this is, the word exams is on there. That's one of the words that kept popping up. Um, but exams really was because there were more and more comments on um, having exams in December and how that can connect with trying to maintain a balanced semester, right? If we abide by the um, calendar, rules of the calendar, the calendar law, then we know exams before winter break, we would have a much shorter um, semester. And this would potentially impact all students, right? So not just high school exams, um, but this would be a shorter nine weeks for middle school, a shorter nine weeks, K-5, right, on down the line. The second word I want to note in that um, cloud is just the word year. And I, the reason I want to point that out, that, that word popped up because it was associated with feedback around year-round. There was not even mention of year-round um, anywhere in the survey. There was no question about that. There was, um, there was no samples. We had samples about spring break, samples about Thanksgiving break. And so um, we want to just share that openly, that there was community feedback from other parts of our district that que ask questions like, has Chatham County considered year-round? Um, would Chatham County consider year-round? Um, I've moved from another district, and I'd be interested in year-round calendar. So that's something that the calendar committee was not, um, you know, was not tasked with undertaking, but that's one we just wanted to make sure we noted um, since that was mentioned in the survey. Any questions? Bank time on that one. 
the bank time. Bank time. With calendar B, we'll have three and a half days of bank time. So we want to make sure we're everybody's understanding if we get weather, that means make up days. Sometimes we haven't had to do this in years and years, but Saturdays and everything else That's is correct. a possibility. That's correct. So. It is, I'm glad you brought that up. It's a definite trade-off with the draft calendar B. We do have more work days spread throughout the year, but that could mean that the later year work days could be taken away for inclement weather makeup. That's correct. And we can always use lobbying to our legislators, legislators on calendar, changing that. Well, many counties, several counties uh, have broken the law and started before. 17. 17. Including the speaker of the house, speaker of the Senate, Tim Moore, whatever he is, um, his own county broke the law. Yeah, ironically, I was speaking to someone in another county superintendent, and uh, they had reached out to their legislator about that, and the legislature legislator said, go ahead and do it. So <laughs> that was uh, a little ironic there. Anyway, any other questions? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Does anybody need a break or are we good? Everybody okay? Okay. All right. We'll move to action items. And y'all been waiting patiently, second through fifth. Um, ELA curriculum option, Dr. Uh, let's see, mine's switching over. But y'all been waiting patiently. It's getting there. All right. Dr. Moran Dr. and Ms. Merritt, go ahead. This agenda item aligns with priority one, curriculum and innovation, and priority three, which is faculty and staff. Um, as you know, our teachers in grades K through five have been participating in the science of reading professional development over the last two years. Um, and during this time, the state of North Carolina also requires districts to have an LIS plan. Yes, it's another acronym, Literacy Instruction Standards. And we have to have literacy intervention plans. Those plans require districts to have consistent and aligned literacy materials across all grades. Chatham purchased K-1 materials this past year and also adopted a program for grades six through eight. And this adoption that we're sharing this evening would be providing materials for all of our second through fifth grade students and staff. Our ACES division worked to evaluate a number of resources and developed a literacy leaders team, which had representation from each of our schools. The team evaluated the vendors using a robust rubric and process and principals also reviewed this feedback and ultimately came to consensus on the EL curriculum. So we're excited about this opportunity for our students and our staff. Um, just a, a quick overview of the financial piece. Um, this would be a one-time cost of $337,087.74 over a two-year window. Um, we're not asking for any additional funds. This is a one-time, not a recurring cost, as many curricular products are often recurring. And what was the amount again? $337,087.74. Um, we would break that into two years, and the purchase price includes all of the materials for our teachers, and these are books, authentic read-aloud text for teachers, the curriculum materials, the workbooks for students, as well as all of the professional development for all of our schools and staff. We have existing funding sources that we would use to cover the cost of this, um, things like state and local instructional supply funds. We also receive science of reading um, funds that are help are designed to help us sustain this work. And you may recall this past year, we used those funds to um, give our teachers the bonus for doing that additional work. What we anticipate next year is that those bonuses will be reduced rapidly because most of our teachers will be finished with that work. We might have a few newer staff that we might want to consider giving a bonus to, but we want to then use those funds for the purchase of the second year of the materials. We also have professional development funds locally that could be used for the, the PD. And we also have state restart funding for any of our schools that are restart schools. We could use those funds as well. 
So um, we have Carla Murray, our executive director for elementary programs, and Darlene reap Klosty, our director for accountability and power school. And they're gonna share with you a little bit more about this process and the product that we're wanting to adopt. And I just have to give them a huge kudos. This was a really, um, if you've ever done curriculum adoption, um, trying to make everyone happy and everyone um, like the product is not an easy thing to do. And we really have reached some consensus with our team and our principals. So I would like to thank them for all of the hard work. Super, thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Superintendent Jackson. I am Carla Murray, the Executive Director for Elementary Education, and I'm here tonight with Darlene reap Klossy, um, our Accountability Director. Uh, the two of us and our entire K-8 instructional team have worked closely and partnered with other stakeholders in this work um, since the beginning of this school year, but really since the literacy plan that we brought you a few years ago um, was required by legislation because this is part of that letters um, work and the literacy plan work. This um, work aligns to priority one curriculum and innovation and is connected to goals one, two, and four. If you'll go to the next slide. Thank you, Mr. Swankle. The next, uh, right there. So as part of this work, we worked to um, create an instructional vision for literacy in Chatham. And we used the Department of Public Instruction's literacy instructional standards that Dr. Moran just spoke about, as well as, as the learning from the science of reading and the science of reading uh, professional development. And we knew that the vision and plan for literacy instruction needed to be updated because of the learning that we've just, uh, con it's exciting, about 250 teachers will complete the letters to your professional development the end of this school year. So we knew that this work needed to happen. Throughout the creation of this vision and the literacy plan, it required us to have a conversation about curriculum materials and teachers needed, that teachers needed in order to support literacy instruction. So here is our vision for literacy instruction. And if you go to the next slide, what we did is we used that vision and we worked to have a strong process um, that Dr. Moran spoke about that included literacy leaders from each school. So together, um, along with ACES departments, represent a, a, a person from each ACES department as well as a literacy leader from each school, we utilized a rubric that we created um, together using information provided from NCDPI, Letters Learning, and the Institute of Education Services to create our very own rubric that took all of that information together to allow us to review many curriculums. And our K-18 did that over a period of time and found three that aligned to current resources and our literacy plan. Um, and that literacy plan includes things that we've come and talked to you before, foundations, geodes, literacy block guidelines, so with this rubric, um, we finalized um, three publishers that most aligned with the current district initiatives and included some that teachers had been using. And we worked together as a group of stakeholders to review these curriculum with the literacy leaders from each school, administration, and ACES team members. It's actually linked there, the, the tools that we pulled from, as well up there at the top where it says CCS rubric, it will allow you to see the rubric um, if you're interested to see what areas we were really digging into. So on the next slide, this was our feedback from our literacy leaders. Um, they used that core rubric tool to evaluate each curriculum. And this chart shows the overall total rubric scores for each of the three curriculums. So we have Wit and Wisdom, EL, and Ready, um, which was, it's called Magnetic Readers. And we dug in. This is a quick bar graph, but if you go to the next slide, Mr. Swankle, um, this really shows another visual review of what we learned. Um, as we mentioned, it was a robust process from multiple stakeholders to gain input regarding the curriculum adoption. And this graphic portrays the numerous ways we collected the feedback regarding strengths and weaknesses of each curriculum. And the main takeaway is that EL scored relatively well in several categories and the group felt 
that EL was the best curriculum to address comprehension and writing, which was an area that we want to focus on um, and that we needed to have a curriculum to help teachers focus on. So these following three slides will allow you to see um, and just have some insight into the work that the literacy leaders from each school, this was a whole day process in this very room, and for each curriculum, this reflects a brainstorming of pros and cons that occurred for the group um, as they debriefed about each curriculum. So you can see that we spent time with each of the three curriculums and really dug in, as well as having that core rubric to guide our work. Um, we also, um, if you'll go back up one slide, um, that works too. Um, we've got to that next one, Mr. Swankel. I'm sorry, it was back down right there. So um, we, after we met with the literacy leaders, principals, and the teams, um, the ACES team, the literacy leaders, the principals all dug in, and we decided we wanted to see it in action. We wanted to see what EL looked like in classrooms. So we worked um, to visit a school in Wake County, Buckhorn Creek Elementary, to see the curriculum in action and talk to school staff there about how it was going. How, you know, talk to us about the curriculum. Talk to us about implementation. And that group included teachers, principals, um, a, a variety of folks. Discussions also occurred with district leadership concerning the scheduling feasibility, implementation, and cost. And based on data and feedback from this process, we are here tonight to request the board approve the EL curriculum purchase for grades two through five. And we reviewed, you know, when we were going through this process, we reviewed costs, as Dr. Moran mentioned, um, and the financial implications implications regarding each curriculum adoption, as you can see here. Um, some have reoccurring costs annually and others do not. And that was part of, you know, just the overall process for identifying a curriculum. And we have identified a number of existing funding sources to support this curriculum adoption, as Dr. Moran mentioned, um, and their existing funding sources right there. I apologize, there is a, a, I thought we had fixed this, I'm 100% sure we fixed this, but if you go back up, um, it says three years right on this slide, and then on the final slide it says two. So the correct answer is we are wanting to split this between two um, fiscal years, so we would pay part of the cost this year with um, funds that we have in this year's budget, and the second half would be coming from next year's budget. But you get more use out of it past the first two years anyway, correct? Correct, it's a one-time expense. We might have to purchase some replacement text or materials, but um, we would not have this large cost again. Are these consumable? Oh, that was the next question, I guess. They are not consumable. Okay. There are um, texts, trade books, okay. um, lots of materials for teachers are online as well as hard copies, but not consumable. So in year three, four, and five, by then we will get something for you. But uh, in, in year three, four, and five, you, where's the staff development money? And, and that is part of um, the cost the professional development and we are we are our plan is for our um, with that professional development money that's listed there our instructional program facilitators our curriculum coaches teacher leaders at each school will be part of that professional development so that the um, implementation is going on for a number of years train the trainer kind of in in work in the building Yes, and principals. One of the, that's right. Thank you. One of the other curriculum leader at the school, so they right. need to be on board. You know, right. right on that. I move the Chapman County Board of Education approve second through fifth grade uh, ELA curriculum as presented. Second. Second. Got a motion to second, two or three seconds. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Who was, and you might have mentioned this, I might have, I was writing down some figures anyway. 
who all was in the, you're talking about in this room, who I, I know you had principals, I know you probably had curriculum coaches, and then you had the uh, facilitators, and who else was involved? That's right. The first day we had literacy leaders, and so each principal was able to select a literacy leader from their campus, and it was a wide variety so of folks. So it didn't have to be the coach, it could be right. a teacher. We had some coach. coaches, yeah. some teachers, some reading specialists. Um, and then what we did was we took the feedback from that literacy leaders group and we shared that information and the data that we gained with our principals. Okay. And then we took a different group to actually CEL in action um, in Wake County. We had okay. teachers, principals, curriculum coaches. And we also met with dual language teachers. Too. That's yes. right. And we, yeah, so we had representation from the district level too for dual language for equity, for um, our ML students within our ML department, EC. EC. So they were all included in that as okay. well. Yeah. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, any other questions? Do we have any other no. no. Pardon? No, we have no more questions. Fine. You good? Yeah. Okay. okay. All in favor of the motion with an aye, please. Aye. 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 Any opposed like sign? Thank you all Thank very you. much. Thank you. Mm. Dr. Moran, that PLS follow updates, we've seen something of that already, haven't we? All right, go ahead. All right, so tonight we bring back for your approval the 24 policies that we shared last month. Those are the fall school board association suggested um, policies. And we shared those with you last month um, and are just seeking your approval. Can I ask a question on policy 8325? That's the one that's supposed to have, and, and my question is, I guess it's, it's, it's maybe Tony in particular, Mr. Messer, uh, it's the one where district can set a figure of what has to be taken to the bank, you know, uh, kind of, I didn't, I didn't see a figure in there, didn't know if we were going to put anything in there or leave it blank. Well, I didn't, okay. Because you approved 500 hours, you need real experience talking about the board approved $500 back to after the school was completed. That's what it is. Well, that's what, it, yeah, it was. But I was just checking. It wasn't in here, so just, that's a typo. it should be 500. Okay, yeah. okay. So I thought, I thought something was going on. Yes, okay, okay, yes, okay. Yes, okay. That, that was the only question That's the daily I had. Bank, bank deposit. The school board's association leaves a blank for us to put that in. Yeah. 1,500, I don't know. It was, a, it was a high 500. Number. We did not want the higher number. Yeah. We wanted a lower number back with, with me, back to you all in November yep. for 500 because we just felt that was more prudent and. Works for me. Yeah, we didn't want that kind of money in the school system. Uh, Thank you for catching that. We can correct that. Any other questions? That's the only one I have. All right, I move the Champ K Board of Education approve the policy provisions as presented. Second. Got a motion and a second. Any other questions, comments? That's a lot of reading, a lot of work, I know. I'll be back next month. And thank the School Board Association for their help in this, too. All in favor of the motion with an aye, please? Aye. aye. Any opposed, like sign? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moran. The Shiva Copier uh, Contract 24. 2024 through 2027. Mr. Swankle. Good evening, uh, Chairman Leonard, Vice Chair Turner, Director Jackson, members of the board. <clears throat> uh, we use copiers here at the district quite heavily. Uh, we lease them. And an we wear them out. And uh, the last contract that we had is set to expire at the end of June. And so uh, back in uh, October, November timeframe, we posted a, a request for proposals to the district website. Um, we had one, <clears throat> one respondent, fortunately, uh, at least one. And uh, it's the same company that we uh, currently have. Um, so we don't expect uh, a big change in the cost to the, to the monthly cost, um, but uh, the pricing is the same. So unless our usage goes up, we should continue pretty much at the same level of spending on copiers. Um, 
right? Move that the Chatham County Board of Education approve the Chatham service contract with Cuba 2024 as presented. She, they made it easy on you, Mr. Swanker. Yes, sir. Right? They didn't have any have questions. All questions. Right. <laughs> any other comments or questions? Yeah, tied to the price of the can being an aspiration still, but. <laughs> all in favor of the motion with an aye, please. Aye. aye. Any opposed, like sign. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. We can get you next time. Uh, we'll have all those questions ready. <laughs> Item D, Mr. Vice, Jordan Matthews, uh, softball member, uh, MOU memorandum of agreement. Yes, sir. Mr. Lim, excuse me, Mr. Leonard, members of the board, Dr. Jackson. Um, the softball MOU at Jordan Matthews uh, is an outgrowth of something that we had done earlier with uh, the Legion ball on the baseball field. Uh, we have three folks here this evening that I'm going to ask to join me. Uh, one is Mr. Barry West, who's the athletic director at Jordan Matthews, the other is the principal, uh, Mrs. April Burko. Uh, Dr. Now, excuse me. Dr. Now, I'm sorry. I see. I told her the other day I'm having to work on that. It takes so, a little while, Mr. Weiss. We understand so, that. Dr. April Burko and uh, Mr. Preston Park, who is He's here from the, uh, the group that is requesting the MOU. So Preston's got a folder. Does that mean he's going to make a long speech no. or anything with that? Okay. I can answer immediately. So this is the same thing we did. Basically, MOU is the same as what, what we did last, I guess, last spring for the Legion team. The Legion ball. And yes, they're here, so I'm sure yeah. that's, they're the ones that have to live with all that and work together. And the, the school, the athletic director, as well as the principal, both, we've talked through this, and they're in favor of this. Uh, Mr. Park and his folks approached me earlier. And because they were part of the agreement, basically, that we already had in place, although we needed to do a separate MOU for them, we felt like this was a good time to do it. And it's going to give our young ladies an opportunity, extra opportunity to participate and stay in the county. So that's a, I love the idea. I moved Chatham County Board of Education to approve the a memorandum of agreement with post 292 Chatham County Fast Pitch as presented. Second. Yeah, motion is second. Are there any questions? Y'all know what you're doing because you've already had to work that out. And mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Hedden's not easy to work with. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, all right. No questions. We'll go ahead and vote. All in favor with an aye, please. Aye. aye. Any opposed like sign? Thank you. All. Look Thank forward you. to seeing one. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Blyce had moved. Item E, capital outlay budget. Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Jackson, <laughs> each year we bring our proposed capital outlay budget for the upcoming year to you. Uh, there's the description in the, uh, in the item with the different categories. Uh, Mr. Schwankel, if you'll scroll down, there's two attachments here. Uh, go ahead and click on the first attachment. So this year we have asked the uh, county commissioners to actually increase the dollar amount for the capital outlay budget. Uh, and there we've asked them to add a uh, increase of $115,000. Uh, we separated that out here just so, because it's not a done deal yet. Uh, and we're waiting for their approval. So we separated that out. These are the projects that we would use here. Uh, we decided to pick up the additional vape detectors uh, for the other two high schools, which will be at Seaforth and Chatham Central, as opposed to some other things. If I may, just Mr. Schwankel, just scroll down just a little bit. Down here at the bottom, keep going a little further there, down there, that chart. So this chart shows you, and it gives you just an idea of what some of the other projects are that we had that we were considering. I did want to clarify this. So in regard to things like, and the first two items are perfect examples, human auditorium door replacements, fire alarm system replacement. We have working fire alarms at all of our schools. We have a working fire alarm at JS Waters. The fire alarm has not failed. It's not in danger of failing, but it is one of our older fire alarms in the district. And if you, when we look at the other attachment, I think we'll find that there's probably another fire alarm in there. 
Uh, what we try to do in a proactive way is to replace systems like that before they fail and before they're too old and we can't get parts for them to keep them in good repair. So please do not misunderstand us not selecting that does not mean that we're not concerned about having a working fire alarm at JS Water. We absolutely do. And if we didn't, it wouldn't be there. We'd be fixing it. Yes, sir. The uh, mobile classroom deck replacement, uh, do our guys still do that or is it kind of passed out? We, we buy the, uh, we now buy the aluminum right. ramps. Which is a great idea. Which are manufactured. Oh, yes. And That's then company. They do. They come in and they install that for us. Yes, sir. They come and yeah. anything after we get them, we they they can our maintenance do, does a little leveling moving if they have sure. to. Am I correct on that? Yes, sir. Those uh, gym and auditorium door replace the gym doors. I'm betting it was built in 1958. I'm betting most of those are original. Now I can't date those for sure, but yeah, I, I would bet they are. The gym. I'm sure they're All solid. Was early solid 70s. core. As fireproof as the day is long, yep. I have no doubt. But, you know, just wanting to replace these things okay. is rare. I understand. All right. So, Mr. Swankel, if you'll go to the other attachment. That's okay, sir. I've got mine up, Jim, if you need to use it. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. Oh, me. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, so here is our second. This is what we're asking for with our normal capital outlay budget. You can see, by the way, the third item there, there's a fire alarm system at CCI. And again, we have a working fire alarm at CCI today. Please don't be concerned about that. Uh, but these are the, uh, the items that we chose uh, for this year's capital outlay budget. Uh, you can see there's a combination of things here. There's some group projects down there at the bottom with the asbestos flooring, HVAC, paving sidewalk, K-8, uh, the pre-K playground below that. There's a group item for furniture and equipment replacement, which actually um, a lot of that is already encumbered with projects that schools had turned in. Uh, popular items, cafeteria, cafeteria table replacements, as well as things like uh, media center and front office furniture, stuff like that are so typical projects you would see there. Um, the technology piece down there at the bottom and then we have some vehicles. You can see we're doing two mowers and a minibus. Boy, having the price of minibuses gone up. I remember when that was a full-size activity bus for less than that. A full-size activity bus now run us about 150 grand. And these are ones, the minibuses basically, they age out at, at probably the high schools, and I'm guessing they are in particular. Probably about 20, 25 years. Yes, sir. The, the, the time limit on activity buses is different than the yellow buses, but yes, sir, they all have a they all have a life expectancy. I remember when those old Chevrolet minibuses that we had were brand new. I was in another district. We had a bunch of them. We drove them everywhere. All right, so this is what we're proposing for this. So there's two pieces here, but they're all part of the same capital outlay project. Actually, it's the capital outlay. Capital outlay. Yes, sir. Thank the COB, you. in case you wanted the, the acronym on yeah, that. You're right. We got a motion. We have a second. Uh, any questions, any discussion? All in favor with an aye. 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 Any opposed, like sign? Thank you, Mr. Vice. Thank you. Of course, that's all contingent on yes, budget passing and all that. I understand. Yes, okay. Uh, our next Board of Education meeting is. Monday, May the 13th at 5.30 here. And do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Got a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I got a second. All in favor with an aye. 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 Any opposed, like sign. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Y'all hung with us. Thank you.